Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, international calls for peace after the deadliest day in Gaza since 2014. Dozens dead as the United Nations meets. Fighting must stop. While tensions there are felt here. Also, tonight, Canadians get vaccinated. I'm feeling that this is a bit of a turning point in our campaign. More Canadians are eligible than ever. The high cost of COVID restrictions for Ontario's farmers and farm workers. What do you think of those regulations? I think they're inhumane. I think they're horrible. How strict rules meant to prevent outbreak among migrant workers are dividing an Ontario community. Plus the undying hope of Leafs fans. Bleed blue, speak blue, and I don't think there's any other colors. Is it their year? This is The National. From the moment fighting erupted between Israeli forces and militants in Gaza, civilians have been paying the price. And today, after nearly a week of fighting, what could be the deadliest moment yet? Three buildings flattened in Gaza, at least 42 people killed, according to Palestinian medics. The anguish mounting with a spiraling death toll. Nearly 200 Palestinians and 10 Israelis killed in the conflict to date. Tonight, the latest in the ongoing tragedy and the diplomatic struggle to stop it. Margaret Evans is in Jerusalem again tonight. And Margaret, take us through the latest in this escalating violence. Ian, it has been a particularly difficult day for the people of Gaza. <laughs> Grief can feel silent. And that's how the images coming out of Gaza felt this morning. People digging for survivors under the rubble of buildings brought down by Israeli airstrikes. Here they're calling for someone named Mohammed. Too often there is no answer and too often the victims are children. More than 50 have died in Gaza so far, according to health officials. There is no way to measure the suffering. A life of a child matters. Today, the International Committee of the Red Cross called on world leaders to pressure both sides to stop the fighting now. Suher Zakut is with their Gaza office. Civilians should be spared the attacks. Both direct and indiscriminate attacks are prohibited by international humanitarian law. Israel insists it tries to avoid civilian casualties. Yesterday, this scene was captured of a Gazan property owner begging an Israeli military official to allow journalists more time to collect their belongings from a building earmarked for destruction. They're not going to get weapons, he's saying. They're going to get their work gear. Israel says Hamas was employing a typical technique of hiding assets behind civilian shields. In an interview on U.S. television today, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pointed to the one-hour warning given to the journalists as an example of Israeli care. It wasn't luck. It's because we took special pains to call people in those buildings to make sure that the premises were vacated. Netanyahu says there will be no end to the Israeli campaign until the Hamas threat is neutralized. And Hamas and other militant groups are still firing rockets into Israel. <laughs> Most are shot down by Israel's anti-missile defense system, Iron Dome. The sheer amount of rocket fire is terrifying because some do get through. They've already killed two Israeli children, and today one hit a synagogue in Ashkelon. There are now fears fighting will intensify even further as Hamas and Israel look to apply maximum damage ahead of any ceasefire. That means more fear ahead for Israelis and Palestinians alike. We're afraid because the bombing is random and the houses fall on their inhabitants, says Mohammed Shahada, who lived on the Gaza Street, bombed earlier in the day. With little chance of escape from a territory still under blockade, there is nowhere to run in Gaza, leaving many with no option but to surrender to the hobbling rhythm of a story repeating itself. And Margaret, the turmoil hasn't been confined to Gaza today. 
That's right, Ian. There are a number of different fronts, and one of them has been growing Palestinian anger over what they see as Israeli attempts to expel them from occupied East Jerusalem and one neighborhood in particular. And tonight, a Palestinian man smashed his car at speed into an Israeli checkpoint at that neighborhood. He was then shot dead by Israeli security officers who've been bringing in giant concrete blocks maybe to build some, build some kind of barricade, but this really does have the potential to turn into another flashpoint, reigniting uh, demonstrations over East Jerusalem, potentially um, with the power to prolong what's actually happening in Gaza. Margaret Evans in Jerusalem tonight. Thank you. The head of the United Nations is urging an end to the violence. The UN Security Council met in a virtual session today on the Middle East. Katie Simpson takes us through the growing calls for a ceasefire. In the first public meeting of the UN Security Council since the escalation of violence, the Secretary General called the hostilities appalling, demanding an immediate ceasefire. This latest round of violence only perpetuates the cycles of death, destruction and despair and pushes farther to the horizon any hopes of coexistence and peace. Fighting must stop. Members widely condemned the loss of civilian life after listening to the top representatives of both sides, who took aim at long-standing grievances, as is often the case with these meetings. The Palestinians spoke first. Israel is the armed thief who has entered our house and is terrorizing our family. The Israelis followed. Hamas targets civilians. Israel targets terrorists. With pressure mounting, the U.S. offered to help reach a truce. The United States has made clear that we are prepared to lend our support and good offices should the parties seek a ceasefire. But the U.S., one of Israel's closest allies, faced some criticism for hampering previous attempts to come up with a joint statement on the violence, criticism from its adversary, China. Regrettably, simply because of the obstruction of one country, the Security Council hasn't been able to speak with one voice. President Joe Biden, who spoke separately to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas yesterday, promised to continue engaging both sides in a pre-taped message for the Muslim community to mark Eid. Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live in safety and security and enjoy equal measure of freedom, prosperity and democracy. Canada doesn't sit on the Security Council. When asked for comment, the federal government pointed to a Saturday tweet by the foreign minister urging all parties to take immediate steps to end the violence. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The shockwaves of the tensions in the Middle East were felt in Canada this weekend as demonstrators for both sides took to the streets. In Montreal today, a pro-Israel demonstration began peacefully but ended in scuffles and tear gas after counter-protesters rushed a police line. I'm the occupation now. I'm the occupation. Saturday, there were pro-Palestinian demonstrations across the country, most peaceful, some tense. Police laid charges against two individuals at the massive protest over the weekend in Toronto. Police also aware of this video circulating on social media, which appears to show pro-Palestinian demonstrators attacking a man. We believe that that assault has to do with that protest. We are actively investigating it. Police are asking for witnesses to come forward. Toronto's mayor and Ontario's premier put out statements condemning hate and anti-Semitism. And one last note on this story. Late tonight, the Prime Minister also weighed in on the protests. In a tweet, he acknowledged freedom of assembly and expression, but said, we cannot tolerate anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, or hatred of any kind, and strongly condemned the rhetoric and violence over the weekend. Some terrifying moments today in a Toronto neighborhood. In the middle of the afternoon, gunfire. Dozens of bullets were fired, at least one man was killed, and the suspect or suspects got away. Linda Ward shows us the aftermath. I was just coming to go get my laundry, and, okay. and I, I heard gun, gunshots, so I ran, I ran for my life. 
A sunny Sunday afternoon marred by gun violence. Four men shot, one pronounced dead while children played nearby. We have kids and we could be sitting out there and you know, so it, it's really scary. It's really scary. In, in a broad, broad daylight, broad daylight. It happened here in this roundabout around two in the afternoon. Two vehicles were parked here, including this Mercedes and a Toyota outside number 22. And a dark colored sedan pulled up and opened fire. At least three other vehicles were hit and bullets hit this building too. The Toyota took off, stopping up the road. The people inside tried to run away but collapsed. Police found two other victims in the Mercedes. Three men are now in hospital, one still fighting for his life. There are, I'm going to say, dozens of shell casings up there. One, one officer estimated at maybe close to 100. Witnesses have described like rapid gunfire, which could be either a semiotic or an automatic weapon. But again, that's you know something I can't really comment on until we more, know more about it. Police say it's likely there were multiple shooters. That's left residents here worried. We start to hear that it could be any one of us. Maybe it could be us come outside and that happened too, right? It's not good. I have a little son. I wouldn't want him to be outside when all of this was happening for sure. And Linda, any indication as to motive? Ian, at this point, police are just saying it's much too early to determine that. They will say that they do believe that this was a targeted shooting. And there was another shooting in the city just a little bit earlier in the day. I won't say if that's connected at this point or not, but they are looking uh, to speak with those people who are in hospital to find out as much as they can about who might be responsible and just why they would do something like this in broad daylight. Ian. Linda Ward in Toronto tonight. Let's turn now to Canada's COVID-19 battle. CBC News has learned an announcement about who will replace Major General Danny Fortin as the head of Canada's vaccine rollout program will happen in the coming days. Fortin abruptly leaving the job Friday night under the cloud of a military investigation into an allegation of sexual misconduct. In the meantime, Canada's vaccine rollout is only ramping up. Over 18 million doses have now been administered, and this week Canada gets its biggest shipment yet. Four and a half million doses from Pfizer and Moderna, along with 650,000 from AstraZeneca. Though it's unclear what will happen with those after provinces suspended handing out first shots. With those early vaccine shortages now in the rearview mirror, Canada is getting closer to a summer of fewer restrictions. Briar Stewart takes us to some joyful scenes across the country this weekend. The sunshine and the music made for a pleasant wait for the thousands who turned up today in Toronto at this mass vaccination clinic. Hopefully more freedom, hopefully helping to curb community spread and we can all get back to normal a little bit quicker. Across the country, more people are now eligible for the shot and the doors will soon open even wider because throughout May and June, Canada could receive an additional 37 million doses. It's so well organized. Today, Ontario's Premier had a brief tour of an overnight vaccine marathon in hard-hit Peel region. The hope was to vaccinate 7,000 between Saturday afternoon and Sunday evening. Cases are coming down. Our escape valve, which is the hospitals, that needs some a little more time more to stabilize. But I'm feeling that this is a bit of a turning point. But starting tomorrow, there will be one big change. Hot spots like Toronto and Peel will no longer receive half of the province's doses. Instead, distribution will be done based on population, a move that some see as too premature. When you target vaccines to hotspots, not only do you save more lives, but you stop transmission sooner so that we can beat this pandemic faster. Elsewhere in the country, younger people are getting their turn. In Manitoba, anyone 12 and up is eligible. Because then I can actually see people and do things. So why not? In Quebec, anyone can get a shot if they're 18 and older. And that is also now the case in BC, where this evening bookings open to people 18 years and older. Over the weekend, people 20 and up were eligible. I received the email on Saturday morning and was able to get my vaccine on Saturday afternoon, and he got his appointment today. As more people get their first shot, there is a growing sense of relief. And of course, the follow-up question. Is second dose likely to be Moderna too? Just when can people get their second dose? Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver.
But while shots go into arms, the third wave continues to pound some provinces. According to Health Canada numbers, as of tonight, Manitoba has surpassed Alberta to claim the country's highest infection rate for COVID-19. Erin Broman looks at why Manitoba is faltering and shows us who's suffering the most. Manitoba's hospitals strained like never before. The patients are younger. The ICU stays much longer. The uh, ICUs are uh, bursting at the seams. The modeling that was done for the province, we're exceeding the worst case scenarios. This doctor says those on the front lines are exhausted. Dealing with the heartache and the sadness um, that goes into looking after these uh, patients is overwhelming. And, and many people are suffering from, from burnout. After Manitoba's second wave peaked in November, case rates dropped in February, then began to rise again in April. That's when gatherings were limited to 10 and places of worship continued with reduced capacity. In early May, as cases continued to rise, the province banned indoor gyms, dining and church services altogether. This past week, schools in Winnipeg and Brandon went to remote learning. The restrictions were put in uh, in place that uh, weren't firm enough, they weren't strong enough. We had a lot of weak spots and even with these latest restrictions, we still have weak spots. We have uh, retail that is allowed to be open at 10% uh, for non-essentials. This week, a grim milestone. COVID-19 has killed more than a thousand Manitobans. So that's my brother and I just outside uh, our house. Dennis Langrell, one of them, was an avid golfer who got sick at home and tried to tough it out. A great shock, a double shock in a way, first to lose him and then to realize it was COVID uh, that carried him off. We think you guys are on the right side of history. Yeah. Langrell's family has a message for those who gather each weekend to protest health measures. It's a bit of a slap in the face, actually. I, I think a lot of people who've lost members to members of their family to COVID feel that 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 memory is, is being disgraced. He asks people to follow the orders and get the vaccine. About 13,000 are doing that per day, offering much needed hope on a still bleak horizon. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. India's COVID outbreak may be stabilizing. The number of daily new cases is falling, but the country is still reporting more than 4,000 deaths a day, and that's creating another problem. Bodies are now washing up on riverbanks or being found in shallow sand graves. Riverside burials aren't new, but the sheer number right now has police pleading with people to stop. Some blame the high cost of cremation and of performing last rites. Mexico battled its biggest COVID wave at the beginning of this year. That's when a Calgary woman, desperate to help her family back home, bought an expensive oxygen device to send to them. But the package never arrived, and now she's going public to our Rosa Marcatelli. These are happier times Eva Oscus likes to remember with her family in Mexico before many of them, including her grandma, got sick with COVID in January. I was not able to be there with my family. My grandma was like my mother to me. Oscus was desperate to help. Medical care and supplies in the area were scarce. It was awful. There was, there was resellers. They were reselling the oxygen, like the oxygen tanks, four or five times the price. So people who don't have the money, they will die. So she bought a $2,400 device that turns ambient air into a pure form of oxygen and paid UPS more than $1,200 to ship it. She was assured it was taken care of. It wasn't. Her grandma passed away the day it was shipped and the oxygen device never made it to other sick family. It was stopped in Mexico over a missing permit, a permit UPS later admitted it should have told Oscus about. Right something the UPS store should have communicated. Like Oscus, customers often rely on the information they get from service agents, not realizing the fine print can say something very different. That's the case with UPS. Despite what Oscus was told and what's in the marketing material online, the fine print says customers are responsible for any documents required. So whatever a person says to you at the point of sale is probably not going to form part of the contract. For Oscus, things got worse before they got better. She asked the company to ship the device back. UPS charged her another $400 to do it. And when it arrived, it was damaged. She asked for reimbursement, but says she was ignored. We are not rich, right? The, 
during COVID time, my grandma passed, everybody was sick, so stressful times. And that UPS is not answering. That's until Go Public started asking questions. UPS Stores Canada has now resolved the issue with Oscus, but is keeping the details confidential. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. The pandemic has slowed immigration in more ways than one. CBC News has learned there's a backlog of more than 100,000 people waiting to take their citizenship test. Rafi Bujikanian shows us the problem that poses. Have I got the email yet? Do I need to prepare my, for my citizenship test? Manakshi would love to help other people find a home. I'm interested in real estate and I'm studying for that. So instead of focusing completely on my study. This is one thing back in my head about my application that why I am left behind. In parts of India, where she's from, it's not uncommon for some to only have a first name. She'd like to legally change that to work in real estate here, a challenge as she's been waiting to take a citizenship test for three years, a scheduled date cancelled at the start of the pandemic. I feel betrayed. Immigration Canada began online citizenship tests at the end of last November, hoping to minimize a pandemic-related backlog. Data an advocacy group obtained through an access to information request shows as of three months ago, close to 103,000 applicants have been waiting for more than a year. Many close to that last step, just looking for that test invite. I wouldn't say they were apologetic. About ben Mansura got to take a test in December. He had to lodge an access to information request about himself just to find out he passed. Now he's still waiting for a background check and a language evaluation. I feel unwelcome here. Immigration officers have had to scramble for this last year as well. This immigration lawyer says it hasn't been easy for government to adapt to the online world, but that doesn't explain people waiting for over a year. It appears clear that there was delays on some applications well before this pandemic. Keep the faith. Uh, more digital uh, testing and citizenship ceremonies are, are coming to you. Ottawa's now sent out more than 65,000 test invites. But with the current backlog, it will take some time to catch up and new applications arrive every day. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Strict pandemic rules in one Ontario community were meant to protect migrant farm workers. What do you think of those regulations? I think they're inhumane. I think they're horrible. Up next on The National, the restrictions some say go too far. Plus, after the longest championship drought, could this be the year for the Toronto Maple Leafs? I think this will be the most significant year in the history of the Stanley Cup. Fans share their hopes for the pandemic playoffs. They said it can't be done, but we're bringing home the cup in 2021. And later, an Ottawa bus crash survivor's moment on the track. And how do you feel? Ah, uh, shaking. <laughs> we'll be right back. Around this time last year, when the pandemic was still relatively new, Ontario was grappling with major outbreaks among migrant farm workers. This year, strict new rules have been brought in in one particular county. But as the Fifth Estates' Mark Kelly explains, many farmers and farm workers say those rules aren't just unreasonable, they're harmful to people and prices. We like to think of spring as a time of hope, a fresh start, especially here in Norfolk County, two hours southwest of Toronto. Farms here produce half a billion dollars worth of fruit and vegetables. It's called Ontario's Garden. But this season, anger is growing like weeds in the garden. At issue, how to best protect the health of thousands of migrant farm workers essential to the local economy. Yeah, and I said, we're not going to do that. That's ridiculous. No, we need It's to pitted farmers like Peter Van Burlo against the county's public health officials. Are they, the health officers, are they making your job easier or harder? No, harder. He's not alone. Farmers' anger has spilled onto the streets here, protesting against what they say are some of the strictest COVID regulations anywhere in Canada. For your safety, suitable face coverings must be worn at all times. 
When workers arrive, they travel maximum three at a time, meaning multiple trips at the farmer's expense. So this is where the men hang out, right? And they quarantine three per bunkhouse, no matter how big the bunkhouse. So farmers need hotel rooms to quarantine all their workers. At 14 days, the costs of rooms and meals quickly adds up. Some common sense could say, hey, uh, that really doesn't make sense, let's do it this way. And yet we're not allowed. We're dictated, this is how you're going to do it, whether it makes sense or not. The food being on the floor is a huge issue for them. Leanne Arnell has been hired by some farmers to check on the lockdown workers at the hotels. Where they can't even get outside and have fresh air. And what do you think of those regulations? I think they're inhumane. I think they're horrible. Many workers feel the quarantine measures are excessive, given they're tested three times before they can work. It's unjust and harsh treatments that, that we have to go through. You know, for, uh, we, we provide, I mean, essential services, you know, for Canada. We're here to work and, you know, our jobs mean, means a lot to us. I'm going to meet a farmer who has operations in Norfolk and neighboring Elgin County. One farm, two different sets of regulations, and Norfolk's are far stricter. There is a level of frustration when no one can seem to explain to us um, how somehow or other Norfolk has to have a whole series of different regulations than the rest of the country. The stakes are high. Scotland has been linked to 217 cases. Last season, Norfolk had the biggest single outbreak on a farm in Ontario. One man died there. The responsibility lies on the federal government, which makes the rules, particularly during quarantine. Uh, I'm not defending uh, these actions by the, by the public health officer, but I would say on the whole, he's one of the better ones. Norfolk's mayor says she wishes the county's medical officer, Dr. Shankar Nezarathai, would consult before imposing regulations. The, the decisions are made entirely in a silo with zero input from either myself as the chair or uh, collectively from the members of the Board of Health. Do you support these regulations? I do not. We asked Dr. Nesarathai for an interview to explain the science behind his regulations, but he wouldn't speak with us. In an email, his office said the regulations were necessary to help protect the workers, adding there have already been some 30 outbreaks in Norfolk County this season alone, including one on Peter Van Burlow's farm. Van Burlow says one worker tested positive while in quarantine, then tested negative days later. He says declaring it an outbreak is overblown. I'm not saying this COVID isn't real. I'm not saying any of that. It, it, this is, and it's our biggest concern. We're more concerned than anybody else. But it's, is it true it's an outbreak? Hell no. So far this season, Norfolk has had 51 COVID cases, far less than any other farm heavy counties in Ontario. But each time an outbreak is declared, the arrival of new workers is paused, causing labour shortages. And, and then if, you know, the folks here in Canada want access to the crops that require a lot of labour, uh, where will we get those from? Well, um, you know, there's always Central and South America. Um, there's the Far East, there's China. Is that where we want our food coming from? You don't think the price of food is going to go through the roof because of all these, and I hate to say ridiculous rules, rules that don't make any sense. We could have done this in a lot better productive way and still be safe. But you right? see that as the downstream effect that there would be a, the possibility of an increase in the price of food. Absolutely is. It's not a possibility. It's going through the roof. 80 migrant farm workers are now drafting an Ontario human rights complaint against Norfolk's medical officer of health. Farm workers have been coming here for 55 years. This is the first time in history where they've actually stood up and had a voice and used their voice, where they've actually said, we will not take this anymore. For his part, Dr. Nesarathai is resigning at the end of the month. With no successor in place, his regulations will stand for now, as will the debate over whether his regulations were based on facts or fear. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Norfolk County. Up next, the Toronto Maple Leafs prepare to take their shot in the playoffs. Go Leafs, go! Toronto, time to stand up. Go Leafs, go! Everybody get your hands up. What a Stanley Cup win during the pandemic would mean to them. And later, what happens when inclusive fashion becomes exclusive? We'll be right back. The 
The quest for the Stanley Cup is now underway. This is the second and hopefully last NHL playoff season under the cloud of COVID. And for long-suffering Toronto Maple Leaf fans, there is hope this year will be different. It has been 53 years since the Leafs hoisted the cup, the longest drought in hockey. But they come into these playoffs strong, first in their division, sixth in the league. Still, after decades of disappointment, fans have learned to temper their excitement with caution. Nick Purden talks to three Toronto diehards about why they will never lose faith. I'm a super fan. I'm definitely bleed blue, wear blue, speak blue, and I don't think there's any other colors. The Maple Leafs are Jimmy Holstrom's life. He hasn't missed a single one of their games in 33 years. Jimmy is an example of how Maple Leaf fans are some of the most dedicated in all of sports. After all, their team has the longest championship drought in hockey, and yet their love is unwavering. How does that happen? Jimmy's blood turned blue the last time the Leafs won the Cup, way back in 1967, when he was eight. I deked out of school and ran over to the parade. And because I was little and squirmy, I got to the front of the crowd. And then I saw the players go by in the cars. And my favorite hockey player at the time was George Armstrong. He picked me up and put me up in the car. And we went a couple of blocks before I realized uh, I'm going to get lost. <laughs> and if I wasn't a Maple Leaf fan, true and true by then, I was sold. Jimmy became a school teacher in Toronto. And then one day, he landed his dream job. I've been the organist for the Toronto Maple Leafs and certainly humbled and proud, proud of it. As the team's organist for three decades, Jimmy has been the conductor for the fans' roller coaster of emotions. So if anyone understands the beating heart of the Maple Leaf, it's him. The Toronto Maple Leaf fans, like me, Saturday night. are just dying to see our team win. It's just all about the blue and white. And when we lose, we don't get down. We don't jump on and off the bandwagon. We're there. We're there for good. And it could be this year, it could be next year, it could be 20 years. This doesn't matter. It's our team. Go, Leafs, go! Toronto, time to stand up. Go, Leafs, go! Everybody get your hands up. Go, Leafs, go! From the front to the back, this is our game. Everybody knows that. Go, Leafs, go! Yeah. I've been making music since I was 12. So I rap about so many different things. Um, but. Specifically for the Leafs, it was just out of love, right? Go Leafs, go! Yeah, we had enough. We want a taste of 67. Yup, we want the cup. Go Leafs, go! Yeah, Azeem Huck and his nephews are all in on the top. Leafs. Go Leafs, go! But Azeem's love affair started somewhere unusual, in hospital. I was born with spina bifida. So the doctors didn't think I was going to be able to walk. Um, and throughout my life, I had various surgeries, over a dozen. It was during one of his visits to sick kids that something almost magical happened. I was scheduled for a test or something that day, and I knew the Leafs were coming. And uh, there was nothing I could do to get out of this test. So I told my sister, hey, if the Leafs come by, you know, tell them I said hi, or please try to get an autograph or something. She knew I was a big Curtis Joseph fan. And Cujo actually came room to room to say hi to everybody, and I missed him. And I was like so torn about it. Yeah. But then later in, in the day, a nurse comes by and he says, hey, Cujo was looking for you. He said that there was somebody missing in this room. He's here right now. Can, can we go, go see him? I'm like, of course. Cujo is asking for me. So when I went down and I saw him, you know, it was just amazing to see that this guy didn't need to do that, right? To go out of his way to remember, hey, I was missing in that room. It was really special. Meeting Leaf legend Curtis Joseph motivated Azim to work harder on his rehab. It has such an impact that today he gives back too. Azim is a professional musician and has donated $10,000 from his earnings to the hospital where he met his hero. Go Leafs, go! They said it can't be done, but we're bringing home the cup in 2021, so... Go if the Leafs go. won this year, the whole thing, the Stanley Cup, it would mean the world to me, not just to me, I know this whole city would be uh, so going go Leafs, crazy. Go. From the front to the back, this is our game, everybody knows that. Toronto all the way. Go Leafs, go! Hey. Coming our way soon, Toronto Maple Leafs Stanley Cup champions.
Jim Vigman fell in love with the Leafs the first time he saw them live. His passion grew so much that when the opportunity came, he went all in and bought a unique piece of Leaf history at auction. I thought it was an iconic piece from an iconic institution, the Maple Leaf Gardens. It was the throne, uh, the only toilet in the men's dressing room. Just think of all the famous people that sat there. You heard right. Jim bought a toilet without plumbing for $5,300. It's just a piece of leaf lore that I'll have uh, and that I'll give to my kids when the time comes. Well, here we are. It's time to flush COVID and our memories of it down the toilet. And it's time to crown Toronto Maple Leafs Stanley Cup champions. Jim has another message, a more serious one. He thinks the pandemic has given winning the Stanley Cup new meaning. We've suffered so much. Individuals have died. We've all had to change our lives. We've had to adapt, including the hockey players. And it will give the people of Canada, specifically of Toronto, a reason to celebrate and say not all is bad in this world. You almost wish they'd win this year above all else. This is the year that I want them to do it. I think this will be the most significant year in the history of the Stanley Cup. These days, in the midst of a pandemic, we all need something to hope for, more than ever. And really, that's what the Stanley Cup is all about. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. The Leafs' first round opponent in these playoffs is the Habs, the first time those two teams have met in a series since 1979. Montreal swept Toronto in four games that year on their way to the Stanley Cup. And of course, there's another Canadian series, Edmonton versus Winnipeg. What's the best way to talk hockey on the national? Easy. Bring in one of the stars of Hockey Night in Canada to give us some insight. Elliot Friedman. Hi, Elliot. Hey, Ian. How you doing? I have to say to you, there's going to be a lot of Leaf fans. We're going to be, by the time this series starts just going to be going through old trigger warnings about that last series that you just mentioned. Yeah, well, you know what? I was in high school. I'm a Habs fan, so I had a completely different emotional reaction to, <laughs> to those clips. Um, now, now, I know you're in contact with players all the time and coaches and GMs, yeah. and so fans are making so much of this Toronto-Montreal matchup. What about the teams? I do think it is meaningful to them. I, you know, even if you're like not a Canadian like Austin Matthews, who's obviously a star player for the Toronto Maple Leafs, or you're a younger guy like Brendan Gallagher of the Montreal Canadiens, you understand what is at stake here. You understand how much is on the line. I, I think that if there's anything here anyone's disappointed about, Ian, it's just that we simply can't have fans right now. Can you imagine what those buildings would be like in Montreal and Toronto with the Maple Leafs and the Canadians and their fans letting out their frustration at each other for the first time in more than 40 years. So I do think there's a recognition of what this is and how much it means. And they know that especially in a social media world, their fan bases will be all over it on Twitter. But you're right. I've been in both those rings during playoff games, and it is a shame we're not going to get that sort of electric uh, feel in the arenas. Now, you're an NHL insider, so I wonder, let me challenge you, is there something you can tell us about this series that a casual fan, and especially a non-fan, might not know? Well, I think that one of the things that's going to be interesting about this is how patient the coaches will be. For example, after game number one, both these teams, even though you can only dress 20, uh, 18 skaters and two goalies, they have extra depth. They have players who are good enough to play who won't be in the game one lineup. And for example, one thing I'm curious about is the team that loses game one, will that coach be patient with his roster? Or will he be making changes immediately? I think, that's the, I think there's a lot of pressure on both of these teams to win this series for different reasons. And I'm very curious to see, Ian, is if someone gets down, will the coach have the calm to ride the emotional wave or will there be pressure to say immediately, we have to make changes and some good players have to go out? On another night, we'll give Winnipeg and Edmonton their due. Tonight, we only have about 30 seconds, but i got to tell you, one of my favorite things this year has been watching Connor McDavid, especially towards the, the end of the season. What are, you, what are you looking for in that series? In every game this year against Winnipeg, and he had at least two points. You can't stop him, but you have to contain him. 
Winnipeg must do a better job of slowing him down or keeping the puck out of his hands or else they won't win this series. It is so nice having you on The National and look forward to seeing you on Hockey Night in Canada. Thanks, Elliot. It's my pleasure, Ian, any time. When we come back, a look at Nike's take on adaptive fashion. It was huge for me. I was very excited to see them adding that inclusiveness. So why did this sneaker miss the mark? Lessons for brands pushing for change. And later, bringing Atlantic Canadian scenes to life one sketch at a time. I'm Jamie Poisseau, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast Front Burner, The Crime of the Century, Alex Gibney's scathing documentary into how Big Pharma created and profited from the opioid crisis. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You're the least 200 meters, right? Marcy Stevens met her own challenge today when she walked two kilometers on her prosthetic legs for Ottawa Race Weekend. Two years ago, Stevens was severely injured when an Ottawa City bus crashed at a station and killed three people. She says today's challenge is a way to thank those who helped her. Beyond prosthetic limbs, people with disabilities have growing access to clothing that's adapted for their use. From fashion to athletic gear, the new choices can be incredibly gratifying. Eli Glasner shows us what's out there, including one product that sold too well. If you could design a hands-free shoe, how would you do it? Nike's Go Fly Ease is marketed as a shoe for everyone. But watch carefully and you'll see they were created with the disabled community in mind. To support our adaptive athletes better. But when the shoes arrived, the support didn't. Talk about accessibility, am I right? Sneakerhead Louis Lingard loves Nike's. It was huge for me. I was very excited to see them adding that inclusiveness. But soon that excitement turned to frustration over the rollout. His rant went viral on TikTok. The shoe itself has been so hyped up and praised for its inclusiveness that it's became limited and resellers and bought gouged the price. The limited supply meant fly ease flew up in price as shoe collectors swooped in. Last time I looked, it was around $500, $600. Wow, okay, well, I will not be able to afford that. After she lost the use of her arms due to ALS, Christina Mallon learned how to adapt. Now she works for the Open Style Lab, an incubator focused on making fashion accessible. People with disabilities, it's the largest minority group in the world. His collection is very different. From More than just shoes, the adaptive fashion industry is now worth billions. This Canadian designer with her own accessible clothing line welcomes the interest from labels like Nike and Tommy Hilfiger. To have these major brands coming in, it's kind of like shining a light on an industry that, that there, was, there was nothing. It was just she doesn't fault Nike's approach, but says it's a direction the industry is embracing. The world is really moving towards a more accessible space, and, and I look at it also as something called universal design. While Nike says it's working to increase supply, Malin says working more closely with the disabled community could have avoided problems in the first place. I urge anyone that's creating experiences or products for people to really think that way because every single person will become disabled at some point in their lives. Bringing the industry closer to creating comfort and clothing without barriers. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, finding inspiration in lockdown. When I start work, I didn't think I'd be that good. A 12-year-old surprising discovery and the response he's getting is next in our moment. So what's your pandemic hobby? This is the COVID kick of 12-year-old Haligonian Carter Noseworthy, who's decided to spend this spring's lockdown learning a new skill. And now people from all over the world are commissioning his works of art. Here's Carter in our moment. This is my first one that I've ever sold. A cottage in Peggy's Cove. I've always had an interest in art. I always like to sketch, do origami, felting, many different types of creative activities. But then during this lockdown, when I had more time, I decided to pick up something new and try something else. So I picked up watercolor and I think it's my favorite type of art. I like to paint 
old historical maritime buildings, I find that look more appealing to draw. And today, actually, we went to downtown taking pictures of some buildings that we that we could draw. When I started watercolor, I didn't think I'd be that good. But knowing that people are actually wanting to buy my pieces makes me feel pretty happy that that I'm actually out there and they think that I'm doing pretty good. So it's going to make me feel pretty good that it's in their houses. Since I like to draw a lot of buildings in when I watercolor, I want to be an architect one day, and I think this will really help me get there. I like them all, but the one at Citadel Hill in particular. So orders apparently, commissions coming in from Istanbul, uh, the UK, the west coast of Canada. So take some talent, some art, some Instagram posts, and uh, all of a sudden you have a retail phenomenon in art. That is The National for May the 16th. Good night.